morning, everybody. Welcome to Lake City. So glad that you're here. Welcome to everyone online. So glad that you're joining as well. I know that this week we're going to be celebrating Veterans Day on uh, Wednesday, I believe it is. And so I would like to know, are there any veterans in the crowd today? Would you stand if you, if you have um, served our country in any one of the branches of the military? Would you just stand? I just want to say thank you. Thank you. And know that if you're at home um, and you have served in our military, all of that applause was for you as well. So grateful for those who have been willing to uh, um, make that sacrifice and be willing actually at, at any moment to pay the ultimate price for uh, freedom. And so God bless you guys. Thank you for your service. Um, starting a brand new series uh, today called Tangible. Tangible. Um, you know, I was reflecting on... on uh, on my, um, my life, and uh, I was thinking um, about, uh, actually, I was thinking about love, actually. I was thinking about love. And um, how many of you have ever attempted to, like, write a love song? Anybody? Anybody ever attempted to write a love? Yeah, okay, okay. We have some funny. Uh, that's awesome. Anybody want to share that with us right now? Um, yeah, I, I remember a time when I was in middle school, actually, uh, this gal had caught my eye, and, um, and so I had this budding romance, um, one-sided, it was completely one-sided budding romance. She didn't even know I existed, actually, and, um, and so, uh, but I was, I was caught up in this whole thing, you know, and, and I thought, I need, to, I need to try to write a love song. It wasn't really a love song, it was more of a like song. I was in middle school, right? So it was, it was more of a, a like song, like I really, really like you a lot. And so I found a guitar, I learned three chords, uh, which honestly, if you can't sing it with three chords, you should not have to sing it, honestly. I mean, everything should be able to, so, so anyways, I gotta, I, you, would you like me to sing it for you? Okay, now hold it. How does this work? Oh, here. I'm not going to put it all the way on. Okay. So D, G, and A. These are the only chords. These are the only chords I know, and these are the only chords you should have to know to sing anything, actually. Um, so I'm going to put this all the way on because it's too low for me. Okay. So, so here it is. Let's see if I can remember it. Never knew you could look so good, ooh, never knew anyone could, and I never knew that I could like you like I do. See, it's a like song. <laughs> never knew I could feel so fine, never knew you could be mine, and I never knew that I could like you like I do. So that was my only, that's the only song I've ever written. Can you believe I stopped there? I mean, good, there's, there's something in here that needs to be expressed. And uh, anyways, you know, unfortunately, I think, um, you know, our idea of love oftentimes is, you know, wrapped up in like these sappy love songs, right? Th this is what we think love is. We think that love is all about this euphoric feeling that we get. In fact, I went online and I just plugged in like love songs. How many love songs are there? According to Google, it's like over 100 million love songs recorded. That, I mean, that doesn't even count the one I just sang for you. I mean, so 100 million of them out there, whether it's the uh, 1966 cla classic, you know, When a Man Loves a Woman, right, by Percy Sledge, or maybe um, you're more in liking to the um, Sinatra era, you know, The Way You Look Tonight, or, or maybe John Legend, When All of Me 
loves all of you, right? I mean, so, I mean, just all, all of these love songs, just so, so sappy. And, 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 but, but here's what they do. They have a tendency to kind of sweep us off our feet and carry us to this blissfully romantic place where love is just so easy because the object of our love is just so easy to love. And so we get caught up in this, like, oh, you're just so easy. How many of you know that love is difficult? (laughs) That loving people can actually be challenging. It it, it actually can uh, be very, very difficult. Um, and, And the best definition of love is a definition that was given to us that really kind of defines how love responds when our buttons get pushed. In fact, the Apostle Paul, he wrote to the Corinthians, and, and, and listen to what he said about love. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 8, it says, Love is patient. Love is kind. It's not jealous. It does not brag. It's not arrogant. It does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own. It's not provoked does not take into account a wrong suffered, does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. Now that's, that's quite a definition. And notice that this, this definition of love, it, it really doesn't have anything at all to, to do with these warm, fuzzy feelings. It, it's not all about like this, these sappy love songs. Actually, love is a choice that is made. And I find it interesting that in, in this definition, it's like, okay, so love is kind. Let me ask you a question. When is it necessary for us to be kind? Isn't it when we're tempted to be unkind? And what would tempt us to be unkind? Isn't it when people start pushing our buttons? How about love is, love is patient? Love is patient. When is it important that we demonstrate patience? Isn't it when our patience is being tested by idiots? <laughs> right? I mean, these pe- I mean, listen, I don't have any, well, no, I do. I was going to say, I don't have any Christian bumper stickers on my car, but I have a Lake City Church one, which, you know, I, I should probably take it off. <laughs> because there are times when I'm driving... And I'm going, are you kidding me? Really? Honestly? How did you even get a license? Right? I mean, and I feel, I feel my temperature going up. Right? I mean, it's, it's when our patience gets tested. Love is not jealous. When, when are we tempted to become jealous of others? Isn't it when They have something that we want and we don't have. And honestly, we're way more deserving. And we get jealous. And yet love, isn't it interesting that the way the Apostle Paul defines love, it has everything to do with how to react, how to respond in moments when our buttons get pushed. doesn't have anything to do with warm, fuzzy feelings. I remember, I remember a time when I went into a fast food restaurant to order fast food. And I went up and I made the order and my wife wanted a hamburger without onions and I was told that made that a special order <laughs> because she didn't want onions. I went, okay. So it might take a little while longer. Okay. I don't know how long it takes to like withhold onions, but it's, it's not, this isn't my business, so I don't know. 
And so I, I put in my order and I waited. And as I'm waiting, the employee that was behind the, the, the counter, some friends came in, not to order, but to just hang out. And so she slipped out from around the counter and went over and started hanging out with her friends. Another customer came in. She got called over to wait on this customer. She runs back over, takes his order, and then slips back over to be with her friends. And I'm waiting. His order comes up. She gets called over. She bags his order. He gets his order, and he leaves. And I'm still waiting, and she runs to go be with her friends. And I'm just standing there, and, and honestly... I'm about ready to blow a gasket, okay? I mean, I'm feeling, have you been in those moments where you're just feeling the temperature rise and you're just going, what is going on here? This is supposed to be fast food. And, and there's nothing fast about this process. And, and finally, a, a manager came out and she saw me standing there and she said, excuse me, have you been helped? <laughs> I wanted to say so many things. There, there were so many things. <laughs> that I could have said. And then I, I just calmly explained to her my situation. She said, I am so sorry. Let me take care of this. She was back in just a few minutes and she had my order. And she apologized again profusely. And then she said, aren't you a pastor? I think I've been to your church. Well, golly. Um, <laughs> You know, there have been moments where I've been so glad that I've not given in to my natural path of least resistance, yeah. 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 right? Because you don't know who's out there, who's watching. And, and, and love, love is not a warm, fuzzy feeling. No, it's, it's not just this euphoric feeling. It's a choice that we actually make. Love is a choice. Let me ask you a question. How many of you have had your buttons pushed during this election cycle? Anybody? <laughs> Love is kind. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. yeah. See, love is patient. Love is not jealous. It's not arrogant. It's not rude. It's not proud hardly even notices when it's been offended. That's good, Mike. Ooh. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So let's, as people of God, as followers of Jesus, I, listen, I have, said, I, I have said before, I, I am going to stand right here on this platform. I'm going to point everybody to Jesus because I believe everybody on this side of the aisle needs Jesus. And I believe that everybody on this side of the aisle needs Jesus. Right. And what I want to see happen at Lake City is I want to see a people emerge that becomes an accurate reflection of Jesus. No matter how, what, what we're navigating, no matter what the circumstances are, no matter whether or not our buttons are getting pushed, because love is patient and love is kind and love is not jealous. It's not arrogant and boastful and rude. It's not any of those. A matter of fact, let me just say this. It's what makes followers of Jesus refreshingly different. Yeah. It's what makes us so refreshingly different that when, when our buttons get pushed, we don't take the bait. We step back. We pause. We don't react. We respond in a Christ like way, in a God honoring way. We do that because we believe that love is not a feeling. We believe that love is a choice. And so we choose to love. We choose to. And we don't just choose to love everybody who's just like us. Right? We don't choose to love people that are just like us. People who look like us, think like us, believe like us. We don't, we don't choose to love people who even love us back. We choose to love everybody. We just choose to love people because that's what Jesus came to do. And that's what we're called to do as followers of Jesus. We're just called to love everybody. Not even when it's going to be reciprocated. 
In, in fact, listen to what Jesus said. Jesus said in Luke chapter 6, verse 32, if you love only those who love you, why should you get credit for that? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good only to those who do good to you, why should you get credit? Even sinners do that much. And if you lend money only to those who can repay you, why should you get credit? Even sinners will lend to other sinners for full return. Then look what he says. Love your enemies. Do good to them. Lend to them without expecting to be repaid. Then your reward from heaven will be very great and you will truly be acting as children of the Most High. Now look at this. For he is kind to those who are unthankful and wicked. You must be compassionate just as your Father is compassionate. Wow. Because he's kind. even to the unthankful and the wicked. Wow. Aren't you glad for that? No, I mean, honestly, seriously, where would you be if that were not true? Honestly, where would you be? I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've operated from a position of entitlement. I can't tell you how many times that I have been less than thankful and felt like I deserve more. I can't, I can't even get in with you today, you know, all of, the, all of the ways that my decisions that I've made over a course of a lifetime have been sinful and have fallen short of God's perfection and what the Bible would call wickedness. Listen, where would we be today if God were not a God who was kind to the unthankful and the wicked. Because that's all of us. And he's compassionate. And we're called to be compassionate even as he is compassionate. Both the Apostle Paul and Jesus call us to a lifestyle characterized by loving attitudes and actions, that we would be patient and kind, happy for people that don't have, uh, when they have something that we don't, that loving those who don't love us, doing good and being generous for those who will not act that way towards us, loving our enemies. This was Jesus' idea. And so, as followers of Jesus, this is what we're called to do. He calls us to love people in tangible ways. That's, that's what compassion is, by the way. Compassion is expressing love in tangible ways. So what is that word tangible? Let's, let's unpack that for a second. Ta tangible. Tangible means perceptible by touch, clear and definite, real not abstract or theoretical. It's touchable, substantial, visible, actual, obvious, tangible. It's like, it's like you, can, you can get your hands on it. I mean, that, that's what God did for us, right? He came in such a way that we could get our hands on him. He came in such a way so that his love could be expressed in a tangible way. That's what being compassionate is all about, love expressed in tangible ways. So how do we do that? How do we develop a compassionate heart? That's what we're called to as followers of Jesus. How do we develop a compassionate heart? If you have um, an outline you want to follow in, I've got two main ideas for you today, um, and here's, here's the first one. Number one, we need to develop an accurate understanding of God's heart. If you're going to develop a, a, a compassionate heart, and a heart that's like his, you have to understand his heart. And so take a look at this passage. This is a great passage in Psalms 103, verses 8 through 13. It says, the Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. 
He's not dealt with us according to our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his loving kindness toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Just as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. And again, that word fear means honor, reverence, hold in awe. It's not being afraid of. Now, isn't that amazing how, how compassionate God's heart is towards us? Now, this is not the view that I grew up with of God. I, I grew up with a view of God that God, God was angry. God was keeping score. He knew everything that I had done, and at some point he was going to punish me for it. I spent a long time in my life just trying to stay out of God's crosshairs. I mean, honestly, I mean, I, I, I've said this before, but I remember an evangelist that came through when I was a kid, and he said, I'm not here to entertain you. I'm here to dangle you over hell on a rotten stick. Wow. And he did, you know, like all week long. That's what we got. We got, like, these were revival meetings. And, and that was the image of God that, that I had growing up. Since then, I have, like, run across passages like I just read. I went, wow, like, this is a side of God that no one really ever explained to me before. So let's, let's walk back through this passage a little bit, okay? So it says in um, verse 8, in the first part of verse 8, it says, um, The Lord is compassionate and gracious. He's compassionate and gracious. What does that mean? That word compassionate comes from a Hebrew word. Get this. It means to fondle. To love deeply, to have mercy, to have tender affection. Wow. So to be compassionate, here's what that means. To be compassionate means to love deeply, to feel tender affection, to desire to lovingly touch, hold, or caress. To have a heart towards someone that says, I want to spare you from what you deserve. I want to show you mercy. Are there people in your life that you just love to cuddle? You, you just, you just love, I mean, you love to lovingly caress? I, I, uh, I love being a grandpa. Being a grandpa is obvious. It's, uh, I mean, it, it's just, it's, it's so much fun. It's, uh, it's like all of the love and the joy without any of the stress because you're not in first position anymore. You're in second position. And I love it when Emery, she's 10 now. And for the longest time, I'd have to, I'd have to like kind of sneak a hug out of her, you know, just try to, try to, I would chase her actually. I would chase, it was a game, you know, and I would chase her and I would get her and she would always try to get to the car before, before she gave me a hug. And then I would take, I'd go all the way out to the car and I would force her to hug me, you know. And, uh, you know, what's been really cool um, lately is um, before she leaves the house, she'll seek me out. She'll run up and she'll say, bye, Papa. And she'll give me a hug. I can't even tell you. Are there people like that in your life that you just, you just long to be with? You long, this is God's heart for you. In fact, as much as you and I feel that way, God has perfected this. His love for you is perfect. It's unconditional. He just wants to be with you. He wants to hold you. He, wants, he has this tender affection for you. Not only that, he's gracious. Uh, it says he's gracious. That word gracious, it's a Hebrew word that means to bend or stoop in kindness to an inferior. To bend or stoop in kindness to an inferior, to show favor, to be given consideration. Now, 
This is God's heart towards us. It, it does, it, it's not because he has to. It's because he chooses to. He chooses to bow or stoop. Or in other words, he chooses to lower himself to be kind to us, to show us favor. Think about that. Knowing everything that you know about you. Forget about the person you're sitting next to. Just everything that you know about you. The things that you have done. The things you're guilty of. The long list of reasons why you have probably at times considered, maybe even possibly you have forfeited the opportunity to have any kind of real meaningful relationship with God because of all the stuff you've done. And yet God has chosen to be gracious to you, to lower himself, to be kind to you, to show you favor, knowing everything that he knows about you. He's gracious. Now, why would he do that? Look what it goes on to say in verse 8. He's slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. He's abounding in loving kindness. That word abounding, it means exceedingly great. It's from a word that means to multiply. So in other words, take whatever it is and just multiply it over and over. So he is abounding. So what, what are we multiplying? His loving kindness. He's abounding in loving kindness. What does that word loving kindness mean? It means goodness plus kindness plus faithfulness. That's what that word means. Goodness plus kindness plus faithfulness. Here's what God's saying. God's saying, I got you. I've got you. I know what you've done. I know where you've been. I know the mistakes that you've made. Listen, I've got you. I have got you. I am good and I am kind, and I am faithful, and I've got you. I'm abounding in loving kindness for you. Look what it goes on to say in verse 9. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. Strive. What does that mean? Now, I, when I first read that, and before I started diving into it, I, I thought, well, strive means, doesn't that mean come alongside and like strive with? No, here's, here's what this word means. This word means um, to contend, to debate, to find fault. In other words, he will not always contend, debate, and find fault in you. A matter of fact, that's why the New Living Translation translates that verse, he will not constantly accuse you. Aren't you glad for that? I mean, he will not constantly accuse you. Ha, yeah. oh, that's so good. Now, why is it? Why is that? Look at what verses 10 and then down in verse 12 says. It says, he has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Wow. He's decided to not give us what we deserve. He shows us mercy. He's removed everything that would obstruct a meaningful relationship with him. He's removed our sins as far as the east is from the west. How did that happen? Look what it says here in Romans 5.8. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. In other words, while you and I were still doing our own thing, when you and I were still living sinful lives and living as enemies to God, he loved us so much that he expressed his love in a tangible way by sending Jesus, someone we could see, touch, feel, someone who was real, actual, to live out a life of love in a tangible way and to go all the way to the cross where he would take upon himself all of our sins. Matter of fact, when the prophet Isaiah talked about Jesus coming 700 years before it actually happened, look at what the prophet Isaiah said in Isaiah 53, starting in verse 4. Speaking of Jesus, he says, yet it was our weaknesses he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. 
He was whipped so that we could be healed. All of us like sheep have strayed away. We have left God's paths to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. All of our sins, past, present, future, nailed to the cross with Christ. God decided to express his love in a tangible way because he has a compassionate heart. And that's why that passage ends with verse 13. Just as the father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. So if we're going to develop a compassionate heart, we need to have a better understanding, a more accurate understanding of the heart of God. Because this is an image of God that I didn't grow up knowing. And if you don't get anything else out of this morning, you need to know this. God is for you, not against you. He's for you. And he knows everything that you've done. And, that, and that's why Jesus went to the cross. He knows everything. Even the stuff that you have concealed really well from the people around you. He knows it all. And he said, I'm going to take care of that because I have a compassionate heart. And compassionate hearts always express love in tangible ways. So he sent Jesus. So if you and I are going to develop a compassionate heart, we have to better understand his heart. And here's the second thing we need to do. We need to allow our hearts to be moved. Allow your heart to be moved. Allow it to be moved. I love this picture into Jesus's uh, encounter with a an individual who had carried a disease and was ostracized from society for years. It says in Mark 140, and a man with leprosy came and knelt in front of Jesus begging to be healed. If you are willing, you can heal me and make me clean, he said. Look at this. Moved with compassion, Jesus reached out and touched him. I am willing, he said, be healed. And instantly the leprosy disappeared and the man was healed. He was moved with compassion. This word, compassion in the Greek, it's an interesting word. It's a a word that means to have the bowels yearn. Okay, so in the Greek understanding, it was this feeling, this compulsion, this this stirring in the inner parts, that when you encountered something and you knew this was not right, this needs to change. Have, have you ever been so compelled? Have you, ever, have you ever been so moved inside that you knew that inactivity was not an option? That you were so moved by either a situation, um, injustice, uh, uh, so, something that just caused you to say, this is not right. Something needs to be done. By golly, I can do something. I might not be able to fix it all, but I can do something. I remember having lunch with a friend who's a lawyer in town. His name's Jeff Andrews. And um, Jeff had a number of clients that were being forced to make decisions that no one should have to make, either by their children medicine or buy them food. I mean, how do you make a decision like that? In fact, he had one client that had to pull four of her own teeth out of her head because she couldn't afford a dentist. And she said, he said, Mike, there's something we have to be able to do. And so he began to research it. And you know what he did? He went to his life group and they raised $6,000 to build that little shed that's out there by the house. And that was our very first food bank. And for a year, he and his life group came together. They funded it. They, they just brought food together and they gave food away every week. That was years ago. And I can't even begin to tell you how many thousands of people have been blessed because someone saw a need and they were moved with compassion and they said, this is not right, something has to happen. 
I remember, Brett, when you went to Honduras for the first time. You took Derek because you thought it would be a good learning experience for your son. And while he was there, God wrecked his heart. He saw people in need. He saw brokenness all around him. He was a part of a medical brigade that had gone down. He's a doctor by trade. And he came back and he said, we got to do something. Pitched the idea to his wife, Michelle, and said, we got to do something. And they did. The very next year, they led a team down. And over the years, since that time, up through 2018, they led over 20 two teams to Honduras. Over 350 people have joined with them, some of them more than once. And they have engaged in feeding programs and educational programs and um, building houses and building churches. They built a learning center for pastors. They've engaged in dental and medical brigades and over the course of time have raised nearly a million dollars to pour into the effort to help hurting people in Honduras. Because someone saw something that moved him to a point where he said something's got to happen. Hal Donaldson, the president of Convoy of Hope, met with Mother Teresa after seeing just the poorest of the poor in Calcutta, India. And she asked the question, what are you doing to help the poor? And he said, not much, not anything, really. And she said, everyone can do something. And that was the beginning of Convoy of Hope. And now, millions and millions of people have been served. I don't have time. We don't have time to roll the video. I'm already over time. Um, if you want to see the video, you've got to stay for the next one. Um, many of you know about Convoy. The, the weekend before Thanksgiving, before we pull up to a table and eat way more food than any of us should, we want to do our part to make sure that there are people around the globe that have access to food as well. And the reason why we do it It's a way to express God's love in tangible ways. It's compassion. It's having a heart of compassion. And so between now and then, be praying. Uh, That is a sacred weekend for us around here. We're going to figure out a way for those of you online to be able to uh, give to this effort as well. Figure out what you make in one day, and then we will... Uh, all bring that in addition to our normal offering on that weekend, November 22nd, before Thanksgiving. And we will bless the world. In fact, um, next week, you're going to be hearing more about how some of these resources have actually been leveraged around the world. And you're going to be able to see what the, the, the love and the generosity of this fellowship as we have en- engaged in compassionate hearts And and, and as we have expressed God's love in tangible ways, you're going to hear next week about all the different people that have benefited from all of that. Listen, as as I wrap this up, let me just say this. It would be a horrible miss if I didn't say to you, if you've not yet experienced God's love and his grace and his compassion for you, you need to do that today before you leave. Would you just bow your heads with me right now? It's a private time between you and God. There may be a whole list of reasons why you would be pretty convinced that you're disqualified from having any kind of meaningful relationship with God. You just need to know that's not true. That God's heart of compassion beats for you. He's compassionate. He's gracious, he's kind, he's forgiving. His loving kindness is abounding for you. Would you just right now, would you just whisper a prayer to him? Just tell him what's in your heart, just tell him. If you need to say, I'm sorry, God, say it. Just say, God, I'm sorry. 
I don't want to try to keep living my life for myself. I want you to be the leader of my life. I want what Christ did on the cross to be applied to my life. I want all of my sins, past, present, future, to be nailed to the cross with Christ. Just say that to him. So, Father, we, uh, we thank you for your compassionate heart. We thank you for your love, your grace, your forgiveness, your mercy. You withhold from us that which we deserve. Instead, your loving kindness is abounding. It's multiplied over and over towards us. And we're grateful for that. And Father, I'm grateful that you have said in Scripture that if we'll confess our sins, you're faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God, do that. We're grateful for your love. Help us develop compassionate hearts. And may we be an accurate reflection of Jesus to the people in our world. I pray in Jesus' name. Everyone said, amen. 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 God bless you guys. If you'd like to pray with someone, we have prayer team members love to pray with you. God bless you as you go. We'll see you.